So now we're going to come to this section about optimality. Um, so a lot of economics is about finding out what the effects of certain changes are, or say what the effects of certain policies are on economic variables. So what are the economic outcomes of, say, changing taxes in some way? But an obvious related question might be, should we change taxes in this way? Or is some outcome good or desirable? Or should we opt for some other outcome? And this is an important set of questions. Um, now the problem though is that it's not necessarily clear always what is an optimal or a desirable outcome. And here's why. So one can imagine that in general this is a moral question. So if our question is what should we do, or should we do this, or should we do that, the answer depends on what our objectives are. So I mean, should we do this? Well, should we do it to accomplish what? Or what should we do? Well, what should we do to accomplish what? What are our end goals? And what our end goals are, or what our objectives are, depend on some kind of moral criteria. So that is, my end goals may be different from your end goals. And really, this amounts to almost a philosophical or a moral question. So let me give you an example. Imagine it's true that, and I'm not saying this is necessarily true, but imagine it is, that shifting taxes from the wealthy to the poor will increase GDP by next, by sorry, by 1% next quarter. Okay, so I'm removing taxes from the wealthy and I'm increasing taxes on the poor and, you know, I'm making the claim that this will increase GDP next period. So should we do this? Well, or put another way, is this optimal? Well, certainly it's good for some people. I mean, it's good for the rich, but it might not be good for others, the poor, who now are paying more in taxes. And so the problem once again comes from trying to aggregate unlike things. You know, you'll notice this is a constant problem in macro. Well, in this case, now we're trying to aggregate different people's welfares, different people's outcomes. So although this policy might be good for some people, it might be bad for others. You know, it might be good for the rich and bad for the poor, but on the aggregate, what can we say? Can we say that on the aggregate, it's good? Or on the aggregate, is it bad? So to get around this, or to try to get around this, I should say, one moral criterion that's often employed is called Pareto optimality, named after this Italian economist, Wilfred Pareto. And Pareto optimality is the following. It says an outcome is Pareto optimal if no one can be made better off without making someone else worse off. Okay, so the best way to say this, or to see this, is to look at something that is obviously not Pareto optimal. So imagine that we have some pie, which I've drawn here, okay? You can even think of it as a literal pie that we're going to share, me and you. Well, something that's obviously not Pareto optimal is the following division. That I get this green chunk, you get that blue chunk, and then no one gets, you know, about a third of the pie. Why isn't this Pareto optimal? Well, one of us could be made better off without making the other worse off if we gave that chunk that's going to no one to one of us, or maybe gave some to both, right? So there's a way to improve at least one of our conditions without taking away from the other person. So this is obviously something that's not Pareto optimal. So what is something that's Pareto optimal? Imagine we redivided the pie in the following way, right here. Now the entire pie is being given. The only way to make, say, me better off would be to give me some of your pie. So say we now also give this to me, okay? But if we do that, we're making you worse off. And if that's the only way to make me better off, well then it is Pareto optimal. There's no way that I can improve my welfare without making you worse off, without lowering your welfare.
Now notice that you know that's one Pareto optimal outcome, but obviously there are many, right? Any division of this pie that doesn't leave some chunk going to no one is also Pareto optimal. So for example, this one on the right is also Pareto optimal, where you get hardly anything and I get most of the pie. That is Pareto optimal, and the reason is because the only way to make you better off is by taking some of my pie, and that would make me worse off. So that's also a Pareto optimal allocation. So right away we can kind of see an obvious flaw in this criterion, in this moral criterion. Many outcomes are Pareto optimal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're nice or desirable outcomes. Okay, so the right pie, I think most of us would agree, is probably not a desirable outcome. And likewise, you could say, you know, you could make the argument that slavery may have been Pareto optimal. The only way to make the welfare of slaves better off was to free them, but of course that would be bad for slave owners, right? That's a Pareto optimal outcome. I wouldn't say it was an optimal outcome, but it is Pareto optimal. And so, you know, as kind of a warning here, I should say that we should always be wary of the use of the term optimal in economics. Okay, so whenever you hear the term optimal, Kind of always think about what it means and what exactly it's saying. Now, why is Pareto optimality so often used in economics? Well, a lot of it comes from these two welfare theorems. Okay, so we're going to see the first welfare theorem and on the next slide I'll show you the second welfare theorem. The first welfare theorem is that under certain conditions, Okay, and I won't tell you exactly what those are, but we'll look at conditions under which this doesn't hold. But under certain conditions, a competitive equilibrium, like the one we just saw in our model, is Pareto optimal. Okay, so competitive equilibriums generally are Pareto optimal. Now, in fact, this isn't that surprising when you think about it. Okay, so what's a competitive equilibrium? It involves people, many people often, freely making trades between one another. So I have something to offer and I'm trading it with something that you have to offer. That's what a competitive equilibrium is. And I'm only going to trade with you if it makes me better off. Or at least it doesn't make me worse off, right? So I'm going to engage in some trade with you only if I can at least stay the same in that trade. And likewise, you're only going to trade with me if it makes you better off, or at least not worse off. And so therefore, we'll trade until the point where neither of us can be made better off without making the other worse off. Just logically, right? We're going to keep making trades until there aren't any more trades that can be made that will improve things for both of us. And now I put here, just to kind of keep driving home the point that although a competitive equilibrium might be Pareto optimal, it might not be a otherwise optimal outcome. So you can imagine, what if I have a lot to trade and you don't have very much at all? You have very little. Well, the resulting outcome at the end of all our trades is I'm still going to have a lot and you're still going to have a little. And so that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good outcome, but it will be Pareto optimal. What about the second welfare theorem? This says that, notice this is going to be the reverse of what we just saw. So let's just go back quickly. The first welfare theorem is a competitive equilibrium is Pareto optimal under certain conditions. The second welfare theorem is a Pareto optimal equilibrium can be achieved as a competitive equilibrium. Okay, so remember there are many Pareto optimal equilibria and then the question you might have is, well, could we pick the one we wanted? I mean, in the last slide, I suggested to you that a given competitive equilibrium might not be good. You know, it might be highly unequal, for example. And so really what the second welfare theorem says is, in general, we can choose the, par the Pareto optimal equilibrium we want by redistributing initial resources. Okay, 
So for example, if you start off with many resources before we do all of our trading, and I start off with very little, the resulting Pareto optimal equilibrium will be highly unequal. But if we redistribute initial resources, so we start the both of us off with very similar amounts of initial resources, and then allow us to trade, this may lead to a more equal Pareto optimal equilibrium. I should also make the point here, when we're talking about resources, I mean, in simple models, we almost make it seem like you're just endowed with some amount of goods, you know, like coconuts or houses or something at the beginning of time, and then you trade. In reality, what these resources are, are things like, say, skills or innate ability, things like that, which perhaps are difficult to redistribute. But in any case, so this is the theory. Okay, well, what about in the case of our model that we just looked at and Pareto optimality? So we might ask, is it Pareto optimal? Well, in some case, it's kind of a silly question, right? I mean, there's only one person in the economy. There's one. So and note here, the firm is not a person. The firm is an entity that's owned by the single consumer. So the question now becomes, can we make the representative consumer better off? We no longer have to ask about making anyone else worse off because there's just one consumer, right? We no longer have to ask the question, can we make the representative consumer better off by, without making someone else worse off because there's no one else in the economy? And so it kind of becomes a silly question in our case. Now, notice that we can rephrase this in graphical terms, right? So. By better off, we could instead say highest possible indifference curve, <clears throat> right? Because the higher an indifference curve, the better off is the representative consumer. And so we could rephrase the question exactly as I have it here, which is, is the representative consumer on the highest possible indifference curve given technological conditions? And when I say given technological conditions, I mean that y is equal to our technology. Okay, we take that as given. And also, given that the government is going to consume some amount of output, we can't change that. You know, say this is just given to us. So what does that mean? It means we could kind of rephrase it graphically as follows. So here again is our production possibilities frontier. Okay, this is negative G. Given that, so this represents now our technological possibilities. What's the highest possible indifference curve the consumer could be on? Okay, well, obviously it's not this one, right? Because, you know, it can't be this point because we could always move in this direction. And so the highest possible indifference curve is going to be the one that's just tangent to the PPF just tangent to the production possibilities frontier. And so I wrote it here already, you know, to uh, I'll highlight it, so to make it even clearer. So what does this mean? The conditions for optimality are that the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the marginal rate of transformation. Okay, that's the best off the consumer can be given the technological conditions. This point right here is also the Pareto optimal point. But notice also that these were the conditions that defined the competitive equilibrium. And so therefore, the conditions which define Pareto optimality are equivalent to the conditions which define the competitive equilibrium. They're the same conditions. In both cases, we have that it's that the marginal rate of substitution has to be equal to the marginal rate of transformation. And therefore, in this case, the first welfare theorem holds, right? The first welfare theorem said, under certain conditions, a competitive equilibrium is Pareto optimal. Well, in this case, we also have that our competitive equilibrium is the same as the Pareto optimal equilibrium. 
Now we can also do this analytically. So instead of doing it graphically, we can do it with math. And the way we do it in economics often is to come up with this fictional person named the social planner. Okay, so this is uh, almost this godlike person <clears throat> who knows everything that's going on in the economy and has control over the choices of the consumer and the firm. The only constraint that this social planner faces is the technological conditions. And finally, the social planner wants to make the consumer as well off as possible. Okay. So what's the difference here between the social planner's problem and the consumer's problem is that the social planner doesn't deal with prices. The social planner only cares about allocations. Okay. The social planner doesn't have to think about wages and so on. The social planner just looks at the technology available in the economy and then says, can I pick consumption and leisure to optimize the utility for the consumer? So to put it mathematically, the social planner's problem is the following. It wants to maximize utility by choosing consumption and leisure. But instead of dealing with the budget constraint, it deals with the technological feasibility constraint. That is those things that are technologically feasible, which says that consumption has to be equal to everything that's produced minus what the government is spending, right? And notice that we can rephrase this, get rid of the N and replace it with H minus L. So the total hours available minus the leisure that the consumer chooses, or in this case, that the social planner chooses. And that's the social planner's problem. It wants to maximize utility subject to the technological feasibility in the economy. So what's the solution? Well, we can solve it in the same way we've been doing. We just have to think about prices in a slightly different way. <clears throat> so recall that what we want is that the marginal utility of consumption divided by its price, okay, which is still just one, is equal to the marginal utility of leisure divided by its price. Now, what is the price of leisure in this case? Well, what does it mean to increase leisure? It means that we work one less hour. And so increasing leisure is going to reduce this term here. Or in other words, it's going to reduce the total amount available for consumption, total amount of goods available for consumption. So in other words, the price of leisure is just how much consumption we're going to give up by increasing the amount of leisure we have. And what's that? It's just the marginal product of labor, right? When I increase my leisure by one unit, it means I'm working by one less unit, and therefore I give up the marginal product of labor. And so this now becomes our conditions for optimality. We've replaced, it's very similar to what we had before for the consumer, but we've replaced the price of leisure, which before was the wage, with the marginal product of leisure. Or sorry, the marginal product of labor. Now, of course, we can rearrange this to be the following. Okay, so this implies, we can just, through simple rearranging, right? And what is this? Well, the left-hand side is just the marginal rate of substitution. And the right-hand side is just the marginal rate of transformation. And so once again, we get this same optimality condition. Now we've done it analytically rather than graphically, but of course the solution is the same. So what's one important thing to come out of this? And I've put this one sentence on this slide because it's very important. The implication is that it makes our life a little bit easier. Okay, so remember that when we first did our graph of competitive equilibrium, we have, you know, so many different things going on, right? We have the production possibilities frontier. We also have the consumer's budget constraint. Then we also have this indifference curve. You know, and so we have to keep track of these prices like the wage and profits and so on, right? 
So what the first welfare theorem tells us is that, well, as it turns out, this Pareto optimal equilibrium is the same as the competitive equilibrium. So if we want to know what the competitive equilibrium is, all we really have to do is look for the Pareto optimal equilibrium. So let me put this here. The competitive equilibrium is the same as the Pareto optimal equilibrium. In our case, there's only one Pareto optimal equilibrium, so we don't have to worry about there being multiple. And so that means we can, you know, forget about a lot of the parts of that graph, right? We no longer need to worry about, say, the budget constraint and so on. All we have to do is solve the social planners problem to figure out what the competitive equilibrium would be, because they're the same. It's the same point. Whether I solve this in this way or I solve it in this way, the point I get in the end will be the same. And so that makes my life easier. I don't have to worry about prices, for example, when I solve the social planners problem. All I have to care about is this production possibilities frontier and the consumer's utility. So that's the last sentence here. So given that the two are the same, it's often easier just to work with the latter. That is to just work with the social planners problem. Just work with the Pareto optimal equilibria because it just has less variables, frankly. Okay, now let's answer this question. The first welfare theorem and second welfare theorem both start with this under certain conditions phrase. And I'm not going to tell you what those conditions are. You're more than welcome to look them up. But it's not really important for us to say what those conditions are exactly. Um, but I will answer an easier question, which is under what conditions do these theorems not hold? So under what conditions does the first welfare theorem and the second welfare theorem not hold? And I list three here. One is externalities. What externalities means is that the price I see in the market doesn't re reflect the true price to society. And so, for example, when we're trading, it may be that we trade up to a point where I'm inflicting more cost on society than I'm internalizing. And so it could be that this is not Pareto optimal. There could be a better allocation that would account for this additional cost to society or to someone else that I'm not bearing. The next is non-competitive behavior. And this kind of goes without saying. And when I say goes without saying, I mean, notice that the first welfare theorem and second welfare theorem both say a competitive equilibrium is the same as a Pareto, uh, the Pareto optimal equilibrium. So obviously, if we don't have a competitive equilibrium, i.e. we have non-competitive behavior, well, then we won't have uh, the first welfare theorem or the second welfare theorem holding. Um, and the reason is because non-competitive firms purposely restrict mutually beneficial trades. So they restrict the amount of output to increase their price. But what that means is that given the technological conditions in society, we could actually produce more that people would be willing to buy. And so there are some mutually beneficial trades that aren't being made there. And the final one is so-called distorting taxes. So up until this point, we've seen lump sum taxes, which are taxes that are just removed, as I say, lump sum from the consumer's budget. But you could also have distorting taxes that change relative prices. That's the important point here. And so one example that we're going to see in the next slide would be an income tax. Okay, so for example, income tax. And why is that? Because it changes the price that a consumer faces when it's choosing labor supply. And so I'm going to show you exactly what I mean on the next slide here. So imagine that there is a tax on labor income. So how can we show that if that exists, we end up in a non pareto optimal equilibrium. Well, for those of you who did uh, some of the practice problems last week, uh, you'll know what the consumer's problem looks like in this case. So the consumer still wants to maximize its utility. Nothing's changed there. What's changed now is its budget constraint. Okay. So now its budget constraint is going to be, I still consume, you know, my labor income 
But because there's this income tax, I only keep one minus T of each dollar of labor income I earn. Okay, so for example, if T is 20%, meaning that I'm being taxed at a rate of 20%, that is the government takes 20% of my labor income, well, one minus T is 0 0.8, or I keep 80% of my pre-tax income. And then plus profit still. So here we no longer have that lump sum tax, I'm replacing it with a labor income tax. Now, what are the conditions for optimality? <clears throat> it's the same as always, so we still have MUC over one, but now the price of leisure changes from just being the wage to being the wage times one minus T. And why is that? For me, as the consumer, when I work, what matters is my post-tax wage. How much I'm actually taking home when I sacrifice one unit of leisure. And so what matters is not just the wage, but the wage where I account for the amount I'm actually bringing home. So this denominator changes from being W to W times one minus T. Okay, fine. Let's now rearrange this in the same way that we have before. And we end up with MUL, MUC is equal to. Or put another way, the marginal rate of substitution Now notice that the firm doesn't face this tax, right? The tax is just on labor income. So for the firm, I'm just going to fit it in here. The firm is still maximizing its profits, okay, where its profits are, again, given by total output minus what it pays workers. And so we still get the same condition of optimality for the firm, right? Taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero just gives us that MPN is equal to W. Or since the marginal product of labor is the same as the marginal rate of transformation, this is equal to W. So what does this mean? Well, in the end, if we put these two conditions together, I'll do it in a different color, so maybe you know it's a little less confusing, all this text. What this means is that the marginal rate of transformation is now going to be greater than the marginal rate of substitution. For this to be the case, this implies that this is now a different allocation, or this is now a different choice of consumption and leisure, right? If we had the consumption and leisure from the Pareto optimal, those two things would be the same. So I'll put C, that's the Pareto optimal choices, CPO and LPO. For this condition to hold so that the marginal rate of transformation is bigger than the marginal rate of substitution, that means that there must be a different choice of C and L now. So that means that this choice is no longer the Pareto optimal choice. Or put another way, this means that if I was the social planner, who again doesn't have to worry about prices, including this labor income tax, if I'm the social planner, I only care about the technological feasibility of choices, I could improve on the choice that's being picked in the market with this labor income tax. How could I improve on it? By picking the Pareto optimal choice. And why? Because we already saw that the utility for the consumer is maximized at that point. So therefore the utility of the consumer must be greater than the market outcome in this case. Here's my short critique on this. So this argument is often used to suggest that income taxes are somehow bad. Okay, you'll hear this 
often from economists, or certainly, or especially you know, certain economists of certain political uh, factions, we'll say. But there's a few critiques we could make. So first of all, this criticism relies on the view that workers will now change their hours, how much they work. Usually, the argument is they're going to work less, right? If you assume that I have some kind of upward sloping labor supply curve, well, then if taxes go up, then I will move from working here to working here, right? Taxes going up is the same as my wage going down. Now, recent research, as it turns out, suggests that actually there isn't very much effect from, from changes in income tax on my work choice. And again, this goes back to a critique we saw earlier, which is that in general, workers don't have that much choice over their working hours. Again, I can always choose not to work at all, but often this is, you know, a very big change that maybe I don't want to make. So if there is a change, as I say, recent research, so for example, you can look at, uh, there's a great paper by Thomas Piketty and um, Saez and uh, I think Stephanie Stancheva, where they say, you know, if there is this elasticity of, of working hours, it's very low. That is, the effect on working hours is fairly low. Okay, so that's one point. We might also ask, uh, how come the consumer isn't benefiting from this government, these government purchases, right? In everything we've seen so far, utility only depended on consumption and leisure. And the government, although it's purchasing stuff, seems to almost just be throwing its purchases away, right? They're not factoring into the consumer's utility function. But obviously, government purchases often do affect the utility of the consumer. So for example, what about national defense? That's obviously something that gives many of us additional utility, you know, to know that we're not going to be invaded or shot at or something. Same with something like the fire department or the police department, right? I mean, these are things that give us utility, so how come we're not including them in the utility function? And in fact, it could be, it's very possible that although these taxes reduce my utility in one way, they might be increasing my utility in another way by increasing G, which no doubt in reality appears in my utility function. This is a big one, this next one. Because we only have one person in our economy, we've abstracted from the redistributional effects of income taxation. So one of the reasons why income taxation is often favored is that it's, you know, quote unquote, more fair. That is, those people who have higher incomes also pay more in taxes, okay? And obviously, to those who believe that this is a fairer outcome, this is a good thing. But here we only have one consumer, and so we don't have that at all in our model, right? We've completely abstracted from any benefits that could come from that. And on this last point, I want to make this point once more, which is that Pareto optimality doesn't necessarily mean a good outcome. It just means we're not leaving anything on the table. You know, we can't redistribute to make someone better off without making someone else worse off. Worse off. And so, you know, it's possible that Pareto optimality might be worth sacrificing for other goals. For example, fairness. It might be worth sacrificing Pareto optimality by having an income tax because it leads to a more fair distribution, right? These are the kinds of questions we have to ask. I'm not saying it necessarily is better, but it's possible. And here's my tweet. As it turns out, I was just looking at Twitter this morning and uh, someone had this exact point. So this is Eric Lonergan, who I didn't know, but I understand is a, I think he's a hedge fund manager or something. You'd have to look him up. But he says, optimal, is this the most dangerous word in economics? And this is kind of what I've been saying is always be worried when people use the phrase optimal or not worried, but at least think about what they mean by it.